get started and welcome everyone who's watching on the World Wide Web. Let's give them a hand this morning. If you're anywhere close to our location, please come out. We'd love to worship with you. We'd love to have you. But this morning, Pastor Arm is on vacation. If you don't know who I am, my name is Randy Sutton. I am the worship pastor here at Activation Church. And we've been doing uh, some good work here in uh, Dallas, Georgia, have we not? I'd like to have some vocal connection this morning with the crown. This morning, this morning I was thrown off a little bit. Uh, we had some fall breakers, you know, fall break. It's happening right now. And just, we need to get lively in this building today. Get lively. Use your voices this morning. So we've been in this series called Pop Culture, which is it's kind of uh, misleading, I would say. Because <laughs> you're like, oh, we're going to talk about culture. We're going to talk about what's going on in the news. No, we're not. Um, so pop culture, power of presence, power of praise, power of prayer. That's what we've been walking through this past month. And it is a culture in and of itself with the children of God. And that's what we've been talking about. But we've been talking about praise. And I think this church is ready to take our praise to the next level. Right? I think we should. Yes, 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 yes. Just feel free to clap. Feel free to talk. Feel free. That's what uh, John was asking me to say to you guys this morning. You know, because when we're children and there's something important going on, we're always told, be quiet. Be quiet. But not today. Not, not ever in this church. If you are going to praise the Lord, if you're going to worship, if you're going to raise your hands, if you're going to clap your hands, feel free to do that. And that goes for the children as well. But why do we praise? Because if we don't know why we're praising, then we don't know what praise is. So why do we praise? What is praise? And is there power in our prayer and in our praise? So why do we praise? Let's talk about that. The act of praise is directly connected to the glory of God. The act of praise is directly connected to the glory of God. So the act of praise is directed, directly connected to the glory of God. So glory of God is the aim and goal of all things. God's glory is the aim of all things. We're going to see that here in a minute. God's glory is the source and sum of all lasting joy, full and lasting joy, real joy, not happiness, joy. See, God is in a class of his own. He is infinitely perfect. He is infinitely great. He is infinitely holy. He is infinitely worthy of praise. You see, the glory of God is the infinite beauty and greatness of God's manifold perfection. Lots of weird words in there. It just means God is perfect in many ways. The glory of God is the manifest beauty of his holiness. The manifest beauty of his holiness. A pastor once said this. He said, speaking of the glory of God, it's the going public of his holiness. Okay? So his glory is the revealing, it's the displaying of his holiness. Isaiah 42, 8 says this. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. So as we can see right there, first right off the bat, Isaiah 42, 8, you see that glory and praise are connected. Romans 16, 27 says this. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Psalms 19.1 says this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. The heavens are telling us of the glory of God. He's shouting at us through creation. He shouts with clouds. He shouts with sunsets, purple, orange. He paints a new one every day. How is that possible? Yeah, it's not possible to me. It's only possible through God. And so he's shouting through creation. He shouts to the moon and the stars. He's shouting, I am glorious. Open up your eyes. Do you see how glorious I am? He's shouting through creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. You see, if we had eyes to see in this room, we'd be able to see the glory of God. We need spiritual eyes to experience 
the glory of God, and we need spiritual mouths to declare the glory of God. Isaiah 6, 3 says this, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, The God, little g, enemy of this world, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Because the enemy knows, the enemy of our soul knows that if he can hide the glory of God from our eyes and our hearts, he can keep us from praising with our mouth the glory of God. And if he can stop your mouth from praising the glory of God, He's already defeated you. If you haven't noticed, we are in a battle with evil. We are in a battle. <clears throat> and God is saying, open your mouth and praise. You see, the most loving thing that God can do is exalt himself and glorify himself above all things. You see, he must be for himself in order to be for us. What is the most glorious gift a father or mother can give to their children? Themselves. And so God, when he glorifies himself above all things and gives us himself, he's giving us the greatest gift he can give us. He showed us that on the cross. He showed us that on the cross. So he must be for himself in order to be for us. And he gives us himself, knowing that it's what will satisfy us most, most is him, himself. So God knows the fullness of our joy is in praising and enjoying him. Ultimately, we praise that which we enjoy most. We praise what we enjoy most, what we talk about the most, what we glorify the most. You need to go back to week two. And listen to Pastor Arm's message on enjoying the presence of God. And cultivate a culture of enjoying the presence of God. Because that's where the fullness of joy is. So God is the only being in all the universe for whom seeking his own praise is ultimately a loving act. Psalms 150 verse 6 says this, Let everything that has praise... Praise the Lord. Everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, why do we praise? Because God is glorious. And all of creation is shouting at us, God is glorious. Matter of fact, he says, if you don't praise, the rocks will. What, is, what are the rocks made up of? Creation. I always say this, but the trees do exactly what God has asked them to do. It's so facto, they're praising. The sun does what it's supposed to do. It's praising in obedience. So that's why we praise. But what is praise? And I toiled all week in Panama City. Lord, what is it that you want? I'm just kidding. It's not like that anymore. But I, I, tried, to, I tried to distill what praise is in one sentence, and it's hard. And I'm going to give you a lot of words, and you're going to have to probably listen to it maybe again or something, or maybe take a note or something. But what is praise? To praise God is to call attention to his glory. Praise, here's my definition of praise. Praise is making a joyful noise that magnifies the Lord. Some of us don't know how to praise because we don't have any joy. And we don't have any joy because we can't see the glory of God. So we've got to see the glory of God. And in seeing the glory of God, we get the joy. And then we open our mouth and praise because of God's glory. So Psalms 34, 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name. Oh, magnify. So there's two kinds of magnifying. You have the microscope and the telescope. Microscope takes small things and makes them look big. Telescope takes big things and shows you how big they actually are. And so we're not called to be microscopes. We're not magnifying a small God. We're to be telescopes. 
that bring the bigness of God here so that you can see it. That's what God's children are meant to do. So we make our big God look as big as he really is. So we're not called to be microscopes. We're called to be telescopes. There's nothing and nobody superior to God. And so the calling of those who love God is to make his greatness begin to look as great as he really is. So praise is the physical exaltation. Praise is the physical exaltation and declaration of the goodness and greatness of the glory of God. So the act of praise is directly connected to the glory of God. If we can't see the glory of God, we can't give him the appropriate praise. So the glory of God, this is our definition of the glory of God. The glory of God is the manifest beauty of his holiness. It's his holiness being known and revealed and displayed. So if the glory of God is the going public of his holiness, then our praise is the going public of his glory. Is that confusing? The glory of God is the going public of his holiness, displaying his holiness. Then our praise is the going public of his glory, revealing glory to everyone. So through prayer and singing and shouting and dancing is how we praise. I'm going to show you Psalm 63, verse 3 and 4 says this, Because of your steadfast love, because of your steadfast love is better than life, my lips, we all have those, right? My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. So when I say, let's lift up our hands, and run, I'm not doing that to see if I can get you to do it. I'm showing you the instructions that God has given us in his word on how to praise. That's why we're called praise and worship leaders. We're leading in praise. So when we say, lift your hands, yeah, it's not a test. We're not conditioning you for later. <laughs> lift your hands in this place. Open your mouth in praise. Jump off that cliff. <laughs> yeah, we're not conditioning you for anything. We're showing you the instructions of God on how to praise. Because he gives us instructions. This is not, praise is not one of those things where, oh, this is how I do it. This is how I do it. This is how I don't do it. He gives us the instructions. Psalms 145, 3 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Psalms 66, verse 17 says, I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. So that's why we speak the praise. That's why we sing the praise. Our sound has great power. Psalm 71, verse 8 says this, My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all day. There again, we have praise and glory directly connected. Psalms 34, 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalms 50, the whole entire chapter, we're about to read it right now. Oh, yeah. Did I hear an excited grunt from Jimmy? <laughs> Psalms 150 says this, Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. What the psalmist is doing here is re recalling everything that God has already done in his praise. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dance. Praise him with the strings and pipe. That's why we see people dancing in church. I know there's, all, there's always a couple of people that want to get on the back row and do a little dance. And then there's always the people in the front that look back and go, what are they doing? <laughs> They're praising Praise him with the sounding cymbals. Praise him with the loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord! Exclamation point. The Bible is not flippant with their exclamation points. They put them in the right spots. So praise is the people of God publicly declaring the glory of God. 
And see, our praise is a powerful weapon against evil. Nobody has a problem jumping up and screaming at the TV when their team scores a touchdown. That's me. I'm a big fantasy football player. And when my player scores a touchdown, you're going to hear me scream, Yay! Yay, men! So our praise is a powerful weapon. We need to get out of our get get out of the comfort zone of just sitting. Doesn't matter what the person next to you is thinking about you. Just get out of your comfort zone. Second Corinthians ten four says this: For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We've heard that verse a lot at this church. So the difference here is a carnal weapon that you could use to hit somebody with or a sword. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a spiritual weapon. You see, we have to open our physical mouth to connect with the spiritual realm, thereby bringing down strongholds. So let me show you in Joshua how heaven goes to battle for us. Because our praise has power. If you would, turn your Bible to Joshua, the fifth chapter, the 15th verse. It's the very last verse in chapter 5. Then we'll go into chapter 6. Joshua 5, 15 says this, And the commander of the Lord's army. So heaven has a... Okay. <laughs> Let's do that again. And the commander of the Lord's army. So heaven has a... There it is, an army. Says to Joshua, here's what he says, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. You see, the commander of the Lord's army has come from heaven, the presence of God. And the only picture we can see of this is at the transfiguration, where Jesus is transfigured, and the glory of the Lord shines on him, and in Moses... When he comes out of the Holy of Holies and his face glow with the glory of God. Now imagine you're a heavenly commander of the Lord's army. You've been in the presence of the Lord for all of eternity. (laughs) And here he is coming down to talk to Joshua. Yeah, you're standing on holy ground. Take your shoes off, bud. And Joshua did so. Joshua 6.1. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. Now went out and none came in. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. Moses is dead. Joshua has just taken over. He's got the army of the Lord standing there telling him to take his sandals off. This is where we're at. Children of Israel... They're called out of Egypt, and now they're going into the promised land. But it's it's got people living there. Now they've got to get rid of them. The first thing I see here in the scripture is they said that Jericho was shut up inside and out. No one would come out, and no one would open the windows. No one would open the doors. You wouldn't see anybody. You know why? Because they're scared. Because they've already heard the story of Egypt. Think about how great and mighty Egypt was, and now their army's dead. And here comes God's people out of Egypt walking towards Jericho. They've already heard of the glory of God. Their God has the power over seas. They've heard that story, and they believe it. So here we see God has already won the battle for him. He tells them, I have given Jericho into your hand. I would, if I was Joshua, I'd be like, but we're over here, and that's theirs. And he would say, you have little faith. Verse 3 says, you shall march around the city. Now he's giving instructions. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. Now, again, if I'm Joshua, I'm thinking, okay, when are we dropping the bombs on them? 
And when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and all the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. Again, I'm Joshua. I'm leading the army of the Hebrew, and I'm saying to myself, where are the swords? Where are the slingshots? Where are the boulders? Where are the fires and the arrows and all this? We're not going to take any of that. What are we going to do? We're just going to shout. I don't know about this. This seems fishy. Of course, the commander of the Lord has spoken this, so you just do it. So just as God divinely created all things in seven days, he would divinely create a people that would be set apart for him in seven days. You see, the whole point of the, the exodus from Egypt was so that God could set aside a people for himself to show the rest of the world how to operate. So the Ark of the Covenant with, with the priests going around the city was a symbol that the Lord's presence was there and that this victory would be done by the hands of the Lord. So I want to show you, we just read the instructions. I want to show you how this perfectly parallels with John the Revelator, his picture of heaven. God takes him into heaven and shows him a vision, and this is what he sees. Here we have in Joshua, we have the throne of God, the ark. That's what the ark of the covenant was. So you have the Holy of Holies, you have the Temple of God, and you had the Ark of the Covenant, and they would come in, they'd bring their sacrifice and offer it at the throne of God on earth. That's where he dwelled. Okay? So we have the throne of God on earth, the Ark, the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, going around. Then you have the Holy Ones of God, the priests, and then you have the sound of God, the ram's horn. Then you have the people of God, Praising and shouting in victory. That's what the picture we have in Joshua. Now, in Re Revelation 4, it says this. We have the throne of God in heaven, and one is seated on it. Remember, I just said they would bring the sacrifice in, and they would sacrifice right there at the throne room of God. Now we have the sacrificial lamb sitting on the throne. Then you have the holy ones of God surrounding the throne, 24 elders and living creatures. Then you have the sound of God because God himself speaks, and the sound that he makes is a trumpet. The sound of his voice is like a trumpet. Then we have the people of God praising and singing around the throne, and what are they saying? They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Worthy are you, O Lord. Our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. I love how God brings us back to him being the one who created all things. Regardless of what the world thinks, God created all things. He upholds all things. And by your will, they existed and were created. So we have the army, the, the commander of the army of the Lord, heaven's military, being deployed in Joshua. Because now the commander of the Lord is saying, this is how we do battle. This is how we do it. So Joshua, through your obedience and your praise, because they're going to play the horns and they're going to shout with a shout of praise, through your obedience and your praise, the battle will be won. It's already over. All you got to do is be obedient. So then verse 6, so Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets. Now, all he's doing is he's going to his people and telling them what uh, God has already showed him to do. <clears throat> the ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, go forth, go forward, march around the city and let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua had commanded the people... The seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of Ramhorn before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the ark of the covenant and the Lord following them. The armed men, verse 9, the armed men were walking before the priest who were blowing the trumpets. And the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. They did not stop. Could you imagine being one of those guys? Sitting over there in the walk. 
all far off distance all day. Could you imagine being one of the trumpet players? Take it, dude. You know they had to do shifts. Can't just stand out there and do that all day. And so, but Josh, Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall you, any word go out of your mouth until the day. Don't say a word until the last day. I tell you to shout, then you shall shout. So Joshua did not want a single word uttered before the shout of praise went forth on the seventh day. Does anybody know why? He didn't want the Hebrews because they're rebellious. They're just like us. They're rebellious. He didn't want them cursing with their mouths the blessing of the victory before the victory was won. That's why, that's why when uh, sports teams, uh, they go out and they play somewhere, they have rules. You can't do this, 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 and this until after the game. They have rules. And so that's what Joshua was doing. So he caused the ark of the Lord, verse 11, to circle the city going about it once. And they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark. And he's just, he, this is just him doing what God has already asked him to do. Now they're actually doing it. I'm going to skip down to verse 14. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did for six days. Verse 15. On the seventh day they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times this time. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord's destruction, except for Rahab and the, the prostitute and all who are with her, because she helped them, and brought them into the city and got them out of the city. Skipping down to verse 20. So the people then shouted... And the trumpets were blown, and as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Obedience, coupled with praise, wins the battle. So when the sound of God goes forth, this trumpet sound, and the praise of God's people shout goes forth, the battles are won, and walls come down. It's a powerful, it's a powerful picture of how our praise can bring down strongholds. But we cannot praise God with a small sound and expect a great victory. We have to be loud. Because if we want big victories, we need to have big voices. We need to give big praise. So how many people in here like watch sports? I mean, surely we got some sports fans, right? You guys are so loud today. <laughs> I watch everything. I watch baseball. Go Braves. I watch football. Go Falcons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's embarrassing. But we're all sports fans. And what do the, what do the sports teams do when they need to position themselves for victory? They stand out there and they do this. Come on, come on. Make some noise is what they say, right? And then the screen goes, make some noise. And they use that voice, make some noise. And everything's supposed to shake. I remember, I was told this story in the first service, but I remember going to uh, Thrasher's games and all six of us would make a whole lot of noise. <laughs> Anybody know the Thrasher's the hockey team? Hockey, man, hockey's cool. I like hockey. Uh, they should bring hockey back to Atlanta. I, I don't know. Maybe it just didn't make enough you know, money, but you know, all six of us really enjoyed it. But they would put that on the screen, make some noise, make some noise. So we cannot expect great victories if we do not give out great praise. So God has already won the battle for us. We just have to be obedient to God's instructions and praise him loudly for the victory. You see, the anointing of the Holy Spirit 
is pictured in the Old Testament when they anoint kings and priests and judges and prophets. The anointing of the Holy Spirit was not given out flippantly in the Old Testament. God would rest on people, accomplish things, and if they disobeyed, he would leave. But we have a great privilege of being on this side of the cross where the Holy Spirit is poured out on everyone since the day of Pentecost. It's poured out on everyone. He is poured out on everyone. And so when his anointing is coupled with our audible praise, his people, the perfection of God, the infinite power of God, the glory of God is then made manifest in our presence. And God can't lose. He's never lost before. You see, his glory is present when the anointing and the audible praise comes together. His, his glory is present. His kingdom is present. His righteousness is tangible. All the fullness of God that was pleased to dwell in Jesus is now available to dwell in us through his spirit. And that's when wars are won and when evil is defeated and the dead are raised. This is when healing takes place and all the authority of God given to Jesus in heaven on earth is then activated and the will of our heavenly father is then accomplished through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our praise. I know there are people that are suffering right now. Last night before I went to sleep, I was praying for a man who has spoke on this stage who is sitting in a hospital right now. Pastor Orm sent me a text message. He's in, he's in critical condition. We need to pray. So that's when we pray. And I lifted up my voice in praise. Because there are people that are suffering. I know there's people going through battles every day in this room. I'm going to give you a chance to praise today. Again. Go ahead. <clears throat> so, our audible praise of the glory of God. Remember, the glory and the praise are connected. Our audible praise of the glory of God ushers in His presence, the holy presence of God, and the kingdom of God is then made manifest. You see, the law of God's spiritual realm then invades our physical realm. I'm talking about two worlds colliding here. I'm talking about two worlds colliding, heaven and earth. Jesus said, pray. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Here on as it is in heaven. This is where the will of God is brought into the physical realm. Souls are awakened. Walls are torn down. Spiritual darkness is defeated. And the impossible then becomes possible. How many people in here need some impossible things? To happen. Of course we do. Of course we do. And let me let me explain something to you about the anointing of, of God. Anytime you hear people say this all the time, man, that song's really anointed. If you've been around church at all ever, you've heard people say, Man, that song's really anointed. It's not the song. It's the people, the people writing the song. Let me, let me show you something. You are the instrument of the Lord. We have instruments up here. This thing right here does nothing on its own. It does nothing until someone picks it up and plays it. This right here will do nothing until you allow it to be released. It's the people that are anointed. You are the instrument of praise. And God is calling you to make some noise. He's calling each and every one of us to make some noise. We cannot be quiet and win big battles. We have to lift our voice in praise. If you're in a battle right now, you need to lift your voice in praise. If you need to be healed, if you know someone who does need to be healed, you need to lift your voice in praise. If you see evil in the world, you need to lift your voice in praise. If you need to be released from spiritual darkness, you need to lift your voice in praise. If you believe that God has given you a victory that you have not yet claimed, you need to lift your voice in praise. 
make some noise because the glory of God must be praised in all the earth. So I'm going to end with this right here. I'm going to end with this last scripture before we go home. Ugh. Too old to bend over like that. <laughs> Psalms 100 says this. Psalm 100 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. I, I feel like he said noise on purpose. Because not all of us can be good singers. Not all of us can do, you know, what she can do. Make some noise. It doesn't matter if it's in pitch. Make some noise. He says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us again with the creation. It never ceases. He's always pointing back. Listen, dude, I made everything. Can you not see the glory? Open your spiritual eyes and see the glory. He says, it is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. In his, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Pastor Arm has been saying this for weeks. When you come through those doors, it's time to turn on some thanksgiving. Come into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness is to what? All generations. All generations. I love that. He said... In 2021, somebody's going to be standing on a stage talking to some people at Activation Church. And guess what? It applies to you. His faithfulness is to all generations. Listen to me very carefully. God deserves your praise. And you are the instrument of God. And you need to open your mouth in praise. We're going to sing this song right here. We're going to sing this song one more time. I want you to stand to your feet. I want to see you clap your hands. I want to see you raise your hands. I want to see you open your mouth and praise the God who has given you life. If there's anything that you have in this world that you love, he gave it to you. He gave it to you. He deserves glory and honor and praise. Let's sing this song. Hallelujah In the presence of my enemies Listen to the words of this song I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah We praise you a weapon is a melody. Come on, sing. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Come on, I might sing.
If there is anything you need, anything you need, I'm going to ask that you go home, you bring it before the Lord, and you lift your voice in praise. Lift your voice in praise. A lot of times what we want is we want to come to church and we want the pastor to lay hands on us, and that's what the pastor's for. God has directly asked us to lay hands on the sick. He has directly asked us to anoint people and pray for them. And we do that all the time here. But I want you to go home and I want you to open up your heart and I want you to lay it out on the floor. Lay it all there so God can see. He already sees, by the way. But offer it up to him. Bring it before his throne and then open your mouth in praise and ask God to do a miracle for you. Because you know what? The battle is already won. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord. We ask that you would move on each and every heart in this room. We ask that you would move on the hearts of the people watching through the internet. Lord, there are many needs. There are many needs. And Lord, we are asking that you would defeat evil in every corner of the planet. Lord, as we lift our voice in praise, Lord, we ask that you would send your heavenly armies and create, cor, cor, just, Lord, correct everything that is wrong. Defeat evil everywhere. Lord, go with us through our week. Lord, bring to remembrance the things in this message, Lord, that we need to remember. Lord, when we feel down this week, I ask that you would bring remembrance to our mind to praise because the battle was already won. Lord, we give you every need that we have. And Lord, we're asking for those people that are suffering in critical condition right now, Lord, that your manifest presence would fall in the room right now, Lord. I ask that you would put angels around each and every one of them to comfort them and minister to them. Lord, we need your heavenly power here on earth. And we're asking, Lord, that you move upon each and every one of us. And we thank you, Lord, for your anointing that lays on each and every one of us, every child of God. Lord, we ask that you would move upon us to pray for those in need. And Lord, if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you, Lord, we ask that you would call their heart from darkness into marvelous light. Lord Jesus, you are my king. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that you rose on the third day, and I believe that you are coming again. If, you, if you've if you never met Jesus, that's the easy prayer that you have to pray, but the hard part is living it out. Making Jesus your Lord is the hard part. So, Lord, I ask that you would go with us, that you would bless each and every one of us, and that you would make this week different from any other week we've ever had because in every problem, in every war, in every battle, we're going to praise our way through it until next Sunday. In Jesus' precious holy name, we all said amen. amen.